one of the people who knew Russia probably as well as anyone in the world, certainly anyone from North America, from the United States, George Kennan, famous for the long telegram from Moscow that sort of commits to the U.S. posture in the Cold War. But Kennan would say many times later that we didn't do all the things that he recommended we do. His essential point was all we had to do was be ourselves and demonstrate to the world who we were and why we were who we were, and Russia would collapse eventually. Well, in his really advanced years, uh, I think he was about 98 or 99 when he came to visit Secretary Powell at that time. He wanted Powell to know that one of the things that was probably the greatest strategic era, in fact, he called it that, the greatest strategic era at the beginning of the 21st century was the expansion of NATO. And he essentially predicted what is happening today, what happened with Georgia, what is happening now with Ukraine, and what's been happening for some time since the wild abandon of the United States and its NATO partners took NATO into 30 countries. Um, imagine, if you will, for a moment, what Article 5 means with regard to 30 countries. Imagine if I were to go out to, let's say, somewhere in West Texas and find me a cattle rancher and say, do you know where Montenegro is? The first thing he would probably say is after he laughed, no, where is it? And I would tell him where it was. And I would then acquaint him with the fact that he is willing to risk nuclear war to defend Montenegro. And I'd ask him how he felt about that. Well, I can guarantee you he wouldn't feel too content about it. And yet that's what we've done. And at the same time we did that, we made Article 5 itself a ridiculous consideration when in fact it was probably the most important part of the political and the military alliance by going into out of area operations, everything from Libya to Syria to Afghanistan and so forth. How, how is that an Article 5 political or military alliance? And then the second thing I'd bring to your attention is what was said by both the head of delegation for Russia and the head of delegation for Ukraine as the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, whose report came out on the 28th, as was previously mentioned, what they said uh, in respect to this conflict. The head of Ukrainian delegation essentially said, we should be working on reducing fossil fuels, which is what this conflict is all about. She had a point there. Don't have time to go into it, but she had a point there. Um, and the head of Russian delegation condemned the invasion. He, he condemned his own leader, Vladimir Putin. Um, I don't know what's going to happen to him when he gets back to Moscow, but uh, that, those were brave remarks coming from these two people. But they were remarks that are uh, unlike what I was saying before about unreality. They were remarks that face a stark reality. And that is, if you look at the technical section of that report, even in the summary, which has to be approved by every nation, but the technical section in the body of the report tells you the real, the real nitty gritty. If you look at that section, you can conclude that you do not want to live in a 1.5 degree world. You probably can't live in a two degree world. And we are very likely headed for a three or four degree world. That's the end of life on this planet as we know it, and we're doing these things like invading Ukraine, or in the case of the United States, fomenting a coup in 2014 and having its CIA support neo-Nazis inside Ukraine as one of their arms, so to speak, um, and all manner of other dastardly deeds when we should be looking at the two really serious threats in the world today. One staring us in the face since the United States abandon the ABM treaty, abandon the Open Skies Treaty, abandon the INF Treaty, and was about to abandon START too until Vladimir Putin said, no, let's probably keep that one, and we managed to keep that one. Nuclear weapons. We have a new lease on life for nuclear weapons. I'm waiting eagerly to see President Biden's nuclear posture review because he promised to take some of this life out of the renewal of nuclear weapons and their tactical utility on the battlefield. Uh, I'm not sure he's going to do it. I hope this Ukraine crisis doesn't motivate him to not do it. But at any rate, even if he does do what he said he's going to do, we're still way behind the power curve on nuclear weapons. And there is big a threat in the 
looking us right in the face as the climate crisis. But ultimately, the climate crisis is going to make even them not mean a thing because we are going to be like the dinosaurs. We're not going to be here anymore. The earth will go on. It'll have no problem. It'll go another four and a half, maybe five billion years before it burns out in the sun, but we won't be on it. And that's the truth. And I'm glad to see that we finally have a report that begins to go into the kind of detail necessary to get people's attention. My question is, will it get their attention? It certainly won't get their attention as the two heads of delegation at the IPCC, the one for Ukraine, one for Russia, made, made a point of, if we keep having these distractors. Uh, it's tragic what's going on in Ukraine, but it's a transient event. It is an event that shouldn't have happened and it's an event that's distracting the world from the things it should be doing. The kind of cooperation, the kind of comity, the kind of peace, as Herr Braun said, that we need in order to tackle this threat and continue to live on this planet. So that's the thing that bothers me about this crisis. There are other aspects of it I could talk to you all night about. This is all about weapons sales. It, let me give you an example. Ukraine was the fourth or fifth biggest weapons merchant in the world. Well, look what both Moscow and Washington, the top two, have done to that. Now Ukraine is selling all of its weapons to itself. The motivations for this conflict are just criminal, absolutely criminal. Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Raytheon, Grumman, and a host of other defense contractors, I call them merchants of war, are going to make a fortune off this. And that's the reason we're having this conflict. That's the reason we started spreading NATO out so we could sell arms to more and more countries. This is utter insanity. And yet we're practicing it. We've been practicing it since the end of the Cold War, and particularly badly. And I don't see any end to it unless we get enough people like you have assembled here tonight that have generated enough power and enough political oomph to begin to make people take notice of what we're saying and to begin to do something about it. And I'm really proud of those Russians who I, I got a report today that there are more of them now actually defying the rules that have been set out for them in the, in the ring environment of Moscow. And they're coming out and they're coming out in other cities too. They are truly brave citizens to do that because they probably know pretty much what's going to happen to them. So that's, uh, that's the essence of what I have to say. This is all bad, and it's bad in some serious ways that we've never confronted on this planet before. The most alarming of which is the fact that the climate is getting ready to throw us off, and we're doing too little about it, too late. We have all the science. We have all the scientists. We have all the data that we need to begin to do amelioration and adaptation and to keep us down by mid-century to two or under in terms of degree temperature rise. But we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. And that's the biggest challenge we've got in front of us right now. Thank you.